Next up, we have a bit of an all-star presenting. Uh, there were a lot of folks who were asking, when's Leon going to present? When is Leon going to present? I went to school with Leon, so um, I'm excited that uh, there's some excitement surrounding We'll let folks trickle in here. So, Leon Tabasco, you've met already. He is a Graceland University alumnus from the class of 1972. Leon is a board-certified therapist who is also a speaker for the Climate Reality Project. Um, Park University visiting assistant professor has worked with Graceland Sustainability Coordinator Jen Abraham White to coordinate the symposium. And let's uh, welcome him right now. Thank you, Jen, uh, for that warm introduction. And, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad that there are so many uh, faces here that are friends of mine or people that I went to uh, school with, uh, people from my childhood, uh, and uh, new friends that, that I've met along the way. And I'm excited to be here and, and to, uh, to uh, contribute to the uh, uh, information today as we, as we proceed. I, I do want to take one moment to thank the uh, students or, or whoever did the, the leaves and the branches. And I like what they've done with the place. It's a very nice uh, bringing the outdoors in, so it, it's perfect for today. So my, my uh, presentation is going to be about uh, the overcoming denial and addictions. And, uh, and I'm going to talk about the principle of mindfulness, uh, which is a... Um, a way of thinking uh, about uh, your experience in life and the choices that you make. Uh, first, bef before I start, I want to tell you why I care about the environment. Uh, when I was a boy, I grew up on a farm in western Iowa, a family farm. Uh, my, my dad was a farmer, my mother was a housewife and devoted in the church, uh, and father was a, a, a man of the earth. He, he worked with the soil and, and raising crops and animals and, and uh, so forth. And uh, for the first 10 years of my life, I was an uh, only child. And I spent many hours and days out in the woods on our farm with my dog and pony. Uh, no joke there, I, with my dog and pony. And uh, in that time, I explored the woods, I explored the pastures. I, I knew the trees in, in that wood. I knew the trails that the animals uh, took or the, or the cattle made. I knew the animals that lived there, the um, uh, rabbits, squirrels, deer, uh, hawks, uh, even badgers once in a while, who, are, who can be a very um, uh, cranky fellow to come in contact with. Uh, but, but by spending so much time, I developed a... a a knowledge and a love for uh, nature and for being in the out of doors. And I can remember laying in some uh, tall green brome grass on the hill and, and uh, looking up into the sky and the sky would be blue and the, the, the uh, leaves on the trees were green and the sound of the birds and, and animals uh, was in the air. And then I remember when, the, when, the, uh, when a storm was approaching and the, and the sky color went from blue to uh, gray. And off in the distance, oftentimes in the west, you could see the, the, the dark thunderclouds that were moving toward our farm. And I would lay there and I could see the leaves on the oak trees. Those would turn. And that was a sign that a storm was coming. I recognized that sign. And then, then you would notice a change in the temperature, like a dramatic change from warm to cool. And as the, as the storm approached, you could, you could uh, smell in the air the, uh, the approaching storm. And, you, and there was a stillness oftentimes that would precede that storm. And if I laid there longer, pretty soon the rain would come. And, but I learned to recognize the signs and symptoms of danger and of a, of a coming storm. And so I would make it to the, to the uh, house or the barn and get in before the rain came, right? I think we are dealing with the situation now uh, in our, uh, 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 on our earth and, and on our, uh, on our uh, environment. 
in which there is a storm approaching. And we need to be able to recognize the signs and symptoms of that so that we can, uh, so that we can cope with that, uh, prevent it, mitigate it, or adapt to it. Okay. Now, um, I also want to talk about this too in terms of why I care. Uh, we were farmers, and so I remember Dad, as I got older, I was able to drive a tractor and, and plow, and we uh, prided ourselves in how deep we could plow the soil. And, uh, and we noticed that, you know, sometimes it would erode when we had uh, uh, big rains. It would wash down the hills. But not, not thinking too much about that at the time. But as we did that, we would uncover tomahawks, spearheads, uh, that were uh, obvious signs that people had been there before. The Native Americans lived there. So as a young boy, it was easy for me to make the connection between nature and, and the Native <coughs> Americans. Right. As I got older, I started driving the tractor when we would spray pesticides on the fields. And Dad said, you know, try not to breathe too much of it. But when you come to the end of the row and you turn, if the wind was just right, it would wash over, uh, wash over your face and, and over your arms. And we knew that probably wasn't good for you. It wasn't a healthy thing. But we didn't think too much about it at the time because it helped with farming. It helped us kill the weeds. It helped us have better uh, crops and better yields. Now, it wasn't until a, few, uh, until a number of years later when my mother developed uh, Parkinson's disease. And I was uh, researching what were some of the causes of Parkinson's disease that I discovered studies about the, the connection between pesticides and Parkinson's disease and that there were higher rates of, of Parkinson's disease in rural areas where there was a lot of farming and pesticide use. So from that I learned that um, all chemicals are not, are not uh, equal and all chemicals are not uh, for our good uh, and that there can be harm that comes from that. Now my parents paid for me to come to Graceland College and they worked hard all their lives so that I and my, and my younger brother could do that. Uh, after coming to Graceland, uh, we moved to Kansas City, my wife and I. And I began to work in the urban environment as a social worker in poor areas of, of Kansas City. And I found that the urban environment was so different, obviously, than the natural environment uh, on, on the Iowa farm or, or elsewhere. And I began to feel a sense of disconnection from nature in that process. And so my wife and I began, uh, every summer when we went on vacation, we would go to the mountains and we would backpack and hike through the wilderness areas because of our love for the environment and, and for how it felt to be there. Um, so in this, way we, in this way, we were able to make a connection uh, with nature. Now in my career, I, I went into psychiatric social work and into um, specializing with treatment of alcohol and drugs. And uh, I want to talk uh, more about that now. I do need to have the uh, clicker. Oh, here it is. Let's see if we can get this going. Okay. So what I'm going to talk about uh, uh, is the overcoming denial and addictions. We are in a culture that promotes overconsumption, substance abuse, and addictions. And, and as Ryan mentioned, uh, these behaviors do contribute to obesity, higher rates of diabetes, hypertension, anxiety, depression, and so forth. Uh, there are a number of chemicals that people become uh, dependent on or addicted to. Alcohol, nicotine, caffeine, opioid, opioids. Uh, the, the pain medications now with opioid uh, abuse are skyrocketing. We're seeing much, uh, a, a big increase in the number of people that come to emergency rooms uh, who, are, uh, who have overdosed on uh, pain medication. Okay. Now, in my role as a professor at, at Park University, I teach a class on, on psychiatric uh, diagnosis. And I, so I work with the, uh, di with the Diagnostic and Statistic Statistical Manual, the DSM-5, 
which is basically the uh, Bible that the American Psychiatric Association publishes and that we use for doing uh, uh, psychiatric uh, diagnosis. Now, uh, one of the things that you see with, with people who develop a dependency or become addicted is that they continue to use despite the negative consequences of using. And, and there are neurological changes in terms of the brain circuits of the, of the brain. Uh, and, and as a person becomes more involved with that substance, they begin to develop uh, signs of, uh, of uh, craving, signs of withdrawal, signs of, uh, uh, of addiction. Now, the, the general, this general definition of uh, substance abuse, according to the DSM, is a maladaptive pattern of substance use leading to significant impairment, distress, tolerance, need for increased amounts of the substance, diminished effect of continued use, so it takes more, and if the person doesn't have the substance, they, they experience withdrawal symptoms. A great deal of time is spent to, to uh, obtain, use, and recover from the uh, substance that the person is uh, abusing. Many times they neglect their uh, important social, occupational uh, activities. Those are given up and reduced in favor of, uh, of the uh, substance. And the substance use continues in spite of a knowledge that, that it's causing substantial problems in their life. Now in the DSM-5, the, the new edition that came out in 2013, they made some interesting uh, additions to the, uh, uh, to the book. One was they added gambling disorder. They discovered that, uh, that gambling activates the re reward circuits of the brain much as, a, as alcohol or another drug does. So they added it to one of the uh, uh, addictive uh, behaviors. Hoarding disorder, uh, which is uh, the compulsive acquisition of objects and a reluctance to give things away. Now, sometimes my wife has accused me of maybe having a little hoarding disorder, uh, which I protest, but, uh, but, there, but there has been an increase of that. There's even a show, I think, on hoarding uh, on TV. Internet overactivity disorder, right? So it probably is not too much of a uh, surprise to know that that's in the book. It's now under uh, further uh, study. Likewise, and this is the one I'm most interested in, nature deficit disorder. So this is under further study. And I'm going to be a proponent that they uh, move it toward in including it in the DSM-5, the, the DSM-6, when they make that. So we'll be talking more about that. But the idea of, I think it's interesting that these are the conditions that are being added to the DSM at this point. And I think it's a comment on the, uh, the, the age in which we live and the culture in which we live. That you have uh, internet overactivity, which means uh, a lot of young men in the basement playing games or, or uh, older males playing games uh, and not going outside that much, right? And children doing the same thing with their electronics. Um, and gambling obviously has become uh, more and more a, a fact of life uh, in, in the United States. So I think these are symptomatic of the age in which we live. And, uh, and it's also note, I also want to make the point that developed countries, industrial countries, have higher rates of anxiety, depression, and substance abuse than developing countries. In one of my students in, in one of my classes at Park, we were talking about this. She happens to be from Nigeria. And, and I asked her about that, and I said, why do you think that is? And she said, well, I, I think it's because we have the, our family is there to support us, that they're nearby. And I think, there's, I think there's a lot of truth in that, that in our uh, hectic lifestyle here in the United States, uh, families are, are spread out from each other, and we don't always have that, that close uh, connection that would help us with times of stress. Now, the question is, are we addicted to fossil fuel? And some have declared that that is the case. I think even a certain president uh, from Texas had said that at one point. When we compare the alcoholic or, or addict on the micro level in terms of those symptoms, and we compare that to the, our society's use and relationship with 
fossil fuels, oil, coal, and gas, the signs of addiction and denial on the macro level are strikingly similar. Continued use despite the knowledge of the negative consequences, right? So when we have uh, 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 issues of global warming, uh, uh, that is a, that's a uh, consequence that has substantial effects, tremendous effects that we're all concerned about. And the response of some people is to say, drill, baby, drill, right? And when I heard that, I thought, well, that's like the, that's like the attic wanting to go get uh, more of their substance. And likewise, important activities at home, work, and school are uh, neglected or given up. The idea there being, we spent an awful lot of money on the wars in Iraq and the Mideast. What if we had spent that on education? What if we had spent that on infrastructure here in the United States? Uh, there are so many. What if we spent that on developing solar and wind and renewable resources uh, in, in our country? There's so much good that we could have done with that. Instead, we spent so much money on these long wars in the Middle East. And, and in effect, important activities at home were neglected. Now in AA, they use the phrase, denial is not just a river in Egypt, right? And this saying is often expressed there. And, uh, and then the, oh, part of what's missing here is um, this idea of, of uh, uh, the, the, the steps in, in, uh, in AA. And it talks about, uh, let's see, where we go? It talks about, the first step is to admit that my life has become unmanageable and, and that I need a, a power greater than myself to overcome that, okay? And, uh, uh, and, we may, and, and likewise, uh, we, we need this higher power in order to restore ourselves to sanity. How do people overcome denial? Whether it's with a, on the micro level with an individual or on a macro level with a society. It begins by experiencing the consequences of our actions. Feedback from family and friends who express uh, concerns about the person. It's a myth that harshly confronting a person with the consequences of their behavior helps break through their denial. What works better is appealing to the shared values that you have, the love of family, not wanting to hurt loved ones, wanting to make healthy choices so they'll be around to see their children and grandchildren grow up. In AA, they talk about hitting bottom, and they say that, it, that uh, everybody's bottom looks different. And whether it's a car accident, job loss, DWI, medical con consequences, and so forth. And it's the direct, and, but what it means is that the direct experiences of the pain and cost of that behavior is what seems to have the biggest impact with people. Now, in, in alcohol and drug treatment, there's a concept of readiness for change, that everybody is not equal when they come into a therapist's office or come into the ER. Some are in pre-contemplation. They don't think that there's a problem, and they, or they deny that there's a problem. Contemplation, that's the second stage. They begin to perceive that there might be a problem, but they're ambivalent about changing. Uh, preparation, they recognize they should change, uh, and, and they weigh the, the cost and benefits and begin to formulate, formulate a plan of change. And then action, the person takes an action and then finally, maintenance, the idea of keeping on track with that new behavior. In motivational interviewing, we use this idea that we ask the participant to identify the short and long-term costs and benefits to them and others of their behavior, of what they're doing, and, and of uh, changing. And when you think about people in denial, whether it's about an alcohol or drug or it's about climate change and, and the environmental crisis that we, we face. These are some good things to think about. What do they love? The, uh, what is, how, how you approach them when you talk to them, the tone of that shapes what happens afterwards. If you start with the assumption that people are greedy and without values, and the, then the tone of what you say is going to be antagonistic. If you're talking to a utility company, for example, about switching from uh, oil and coal over to wind and solar. If you approach them with uh, the idea that they are uh, the enemy, 
then they are probably going to respond with defensiveness. If you call into question a person's entire way of life, the reaction you probably get will be defensive. It is better to have a conversation with people in denial than to have an argument, right? So when talking with someone in denial, it's best to approach them and to convey respect. And Michael has talked about that in terms of being respectful to utility companies when, uh, when he approaches them and talk, to talk about the renewables. It's best to begin that conversation by listening to their point of view, especially for their positive values, and then reflect back the perception of what they value. It sounds like the health of your family and children are important to you. Whether it's denial about substances or fuel, fossil fuels, the, the, the approach is the same. A approach with respect, listen to their core values, reflect back the values you hear, identify values that you have in common, and, and share your personal story about why you care about the environment or why you care about the, about the subject. And by doing that, you can result, it can result in some rapport, building trust, and you can have more of an ongoing conversation. Now, many people are conditioned to take seriously only those things that pertain to their to themselves, their family, their relatives, and their close friends. And the idea of identifying with all humans and all living species on the planet seems to be of little concern. Many people believe that God won't let that happen when it comes to environmental destruction. Some people say, there's nothing I can do about it, so I don't think about it. The impact of global warming seems remote, and it makes it difficult to connect what's happening on, on the earth, around the earth overall and what is happening to a single in an individual in a, in a particular place. But when, when extreme uh, weather happens, whether it's in New Jersey or New Orleans or California, uh, that when that happens, people and communities, when they're, when they're directly affected, they start to think that maybe climate change is a reality. Viktor Frankl was a, a Jewish psychiatrist that was in the uh, in uh, concentration camps, four concentration camps in Germany during World War II. He lost his family, all of his belongings. Uh, his whole family died in the camps. He survived. And he said, they can take everything away from you, but they can't take away your ability to choose your attitude about your situation. So in that space between stimulus and response, whether it's a beer commercial, whether it's a commercial from the Koch brothers about uh, all the good work that they do, uh, uh, and, but we have a choice in terms of our response. But many times if we're not aware, if we're not uh, thinking about what that means, we can react uh, in an automatic way to the stimulus. Mindfulness, I mentioned earlier, can help us mitigate and adapt to the environmental crisis. Mindfulness is being fully aware of what, what is happening in the present moment without filters or without judgment. Mindfulness consists of cultivating awareness of the mind-body connection and living in the here and now. Now, it is rooted in, in Buddhist, in the Buddhist tradition, uh, but it, it's, a universe, it's becoming a universal practice in terms of the use of mindfulness meditation to deal with anxiety, depression, alcohol and drug issues, and so forth. And I think we can use it when we look at the environmental crisis that we face. By f being fully aware in the present without judgment, we can recognize that the increased consumption of goods and services has, has come to be equated with the pursuit of happiness. Yet the level of happiness in modern U.S. society has not increased with the level of consumption. Studies show that after meeting the basic needs for food, clothing, shelter, uh, transportation, and health care, individuals and families don't really make tangible increases in their happiness by continuing to acquire objects. And I'm sure you've all heard this phrase, he who dies with the most toys win. Now, Al Gore, I'm, I'm quoting him on this because he said it was intended as a humorous comment about 
our current behavior, but as a diagnosis of our current beliefs about the purpose of life, it contains more than a grain of truth. We already have the scientific evidence we need to know that human activity, especially the burning of fossil fuels, is interfering with the, nat the natural balance of the climate, and it seriously threatens the health of the natural ecosystems upon which all life on Earth depends. Humans are inherently social beings, and our survival as a species has resulted not only in the survival of the fittest individuals, but also on our ability to cooperate with kinship, tribes, and species. People need to know that, and to feel that there is hope and that they can take actions that will make a difference. And that's what we hope will happen today. That as you listen to the speakers, as you dialogue with the speakers, uh, that you will think about what am I doing now, to, the actions am I taking now that, uh, to help with this uh, situation, and what else could I do that would help with it. Through the practice of mindfulness, we can expand our circle of identification and, and have compassion for all species. And this is a quote from Thich Nhat uh, Hanh, who is a Vietnamese a Buddhist monk. And what he talks about here, and, and, and this is the point that I'll draw to a close because of time. Aware of the human species as an animal species, though it has a culture and has become sovereign of the earth, I breathe in. Seeing that the human species cannot exist without the animal, vegetal, and mineral species, I breathe out. Seeing the presence of the human species in the presence of the animal, vegetal, and mineral species, I breathe in. Seeing that my idea of myself as belonging to a separate, independent species is an error, I breathe out. So I want to leave, leave you with that thought. Uh, in psychology, uh, there has been a, a growth of what we're calling uh, conservation psychology and eco-psychology. And one of the... Uh, uh, tremendous ideas from this that I think is useful is the idea of the ecological self. And the ecological self is seeing ourselves as a part of nature. Not that we're uh, uh, apart from or that we're separate from, but that we are part of nature too. And to identify with all of life and how can we be compassionate and supportive of all of life on this planet. Thank you so much.